and verse number 4. John chapter 4 and verse 4. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus upon the well, and was about the sixth hour. And there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria to him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now note verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have, wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Father, bless this holy book now, this blessed book that you've left for us, you've given us, Heavenly Father, your word. In Jesus' name, amen. In verse number 14 it says, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, now note carefully, springing up into everlasting life. Eternal life is a theme of the Gospel of John. People who preach that you can lose your salvation treat the Gospel of John like the plague. And the reason they do is because it is loaded with statements about the fact that once you are saved, you are always saved. No man can pluck you from the Father's hand. I give to them the Holy Spirit, and he has a seal of the inheritance. In verse 14, this water is into everlasting life. Now what you have here in the Gospel of John, chapter number 4, is an encounter. And the signs of John, or the miracles of John, are called signs, so they're different. These are encounters that you find throughout the Gospel of John. It's good to study the encounter between a human being and Almighty God manifest in the flesh. That's a good thing to study because what you'll see is how he deals individually with these people. For example, Nicodemus came to him and says, We know thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the things thou doest except God be with him. Nicodemus was a smart man. He was willing to go on his own. He took the initiative to go talk to this man. And he said, there's something different about you. No question about that. You're not like the rest of them. And what did the Lord Jesus say to this man? Because no doubt Nicodemus was a good moral man. No doubt, no doubt that. There's nothing said to, uh, otherwise about him. He was a good moral man. He was a man that no doubt had adhered to as much of the law as he possibly could. But the Lord Jesus said plainly to Nicodemus, you must be born again. He didn't argue points of theology with him. He didn't get into the Mishnah. He didn't get into all of that. He simply said, you must be born again. When the disciples in John chapter number 6, there's an encounter with them. And he said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And of course, they threw their hands up and said, how can this be? It shows you how that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, foolishness to him, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. The Lord Jesus said, the words that I say unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Understand, therefore, that 2,000 years ago, he died on the cross for our sins. Can you eat his body today? 2,000 years later? Of course not. It had nothing to do with his physical flesh. It had to do with what that flesh understood to be, the symbology of it, the typology of it, and the fact that there was a spiritual thing about that flesh. So the disciples, having no ability to make discernment of spiritual things, many of them departed from him. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 8 and verse number 44, we have one of the, we have one of the most caustic confrontations in the whole Bible. It doesn't get any worse than this. In John 8, 44, he said, You are of your father the devil, and the works of your father you will do. He was a murderer in the beginning. And my friend, this is a confrontation between the Lord Jesus Christ and religion. What we have in John 8 is religion. Religion stumbling about in its blindness. Religion stumbling about in its man-made theocracy and theology. Religion didn't come from God. Religion came from the devil. It is his substitute for the truth. And this country today is full of the Christian religion. 
It's a, it's a cultural thing, depending on what part of the country you're in. You are introduced to the Christian religion. You don't want any part of it. Let me warn you right now. Forget the Christian religion. You want Christ. Amen. That's the issue in John. But these people here in John 8, 44 were stuck. I mean, they were, they were, they were anchored in their religion. Nothing would move them from it. And they had a lot of reasons for it. But it's a confrontation nonetheless. If you've ever talked to someone about the Lord Jesus Christ and they're in their, steeped in their religion, you'll understand what's going on here in John chapter number 8. Then in John chapter number 9, a confrontation with a man that is born blind. Notice how this thing comes in the gospel of John. These all have to do with the revelation of his deity, who he is, and it's about him. There is no book in the Bible that is more about the Lord Jesus Christ than the gospel of John. That's not to say that Matthew, Mark, and Luke is not. They are. But the gospel of John is all about his deity and everlasting life. So the man born blind represents the lost man. The man cannot see. Oh, you think you can see. You think you've got a hold of it. You think you can understand. But the truth of the matter is until you meet the Lord Jesus Christ, you are stumbling in darkness and you are blind to the truth of God and to who you really are. As you get older, you realize you've got a problem. You take any man that's got half sense, he understands that. He knows he's got a problem. He sets about to reform. He sets about to do this and that, try this religion, try that, and they all fail. And the reason they failed is because they're man-made junk. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only answer to your problems. Amen. And then we have the miracle of Lazarus. And one of the, this is one of the saddest things in the Bible. Not that he raised Lazarus from the dead. He did. John 11, he raised him from the dead. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible said, the hour is coming when all that are in the grave shall hear the voice of the Son of God and come forth. Amen. Amen. The everlasting life. He is the life. He's the giver of life. And my friend, if you hear his voice and know him, you know life. He said in John 11, come forth Lazarus, loose him and let him go. But the witnesses that were sent there, the spies for the Pharisees to spy out what had happened, went back and told their bosses about it. Do you think it converted them to see a dead man come forth from the dead? No, it didn't change them. Not one bit. You see, miracles, my friend, alone is not going to get the job done. If Janice and Jambres can make a snake out of a stick, my dear friend, and in Revelation 13 it says he has power to call fire down from heaven. Get ready for every kind of satanic miracle under the sun because they're coming, dear friend. No, there's got to be more than miracles. So what is it? The person of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus. Have you noticed how that this is not about Christ? Have you noticed this is not so much about what he's done? Have you noticed that my preaching this morning is not so much about what people said about him? It's not so much about what is it, preacher? It's him. Preach Christ and him crucified. It's not my job to interpret everything he said. It's not my job to interpret everything he did. My job is to preach Christ and him crucified. Hallelujah to God. If I could just get that over to you folks today. And it's sure not about some stuck-up, smart aleck preacher that wants you to think he's the greatest thing on earth. Amen. Watch him die. Didn't you lose any sleep over it, did you? Did you see it affect the church of God? Not one bit. I'm here today and I'm gone tomorrow. But the Lord Jesus Christ is our life. He's the heartbeat of your soul. And so the Bible says in John 11, they went away. But now what I want to call your attention to this morning is John 4. The woman at the well. Now Samaria, as you know, have been heard many times, was north of Jerusalem. Samaria, depending on who you talk to 2,000 years ago, they were pagan, heathen, everything else under the sun. But the average Jew would have nothing to do with Samaritans. Nothing to do with them. One of the reasons they had nothing to do with them because the Samaritans had their own Pentateuch. The first five books of Moses written about 1,400 years before Christ. They had Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. This is why she could say our father Jacob, because they had that. But they rejected the prophets of the Old Testament, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. They rejected the prophets of the Old Testament. 
So what did that do? Well, it got them, it, it was a terrible burden for them. And so the Lord Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria. I must needs go through Samaria. Now, what do you think about this for a moment? He went to one woman at a well. Think about it for a moment. Think of all the other people that he could have gone to. I mean, there's only one of him 2,000 years ago. And every place he put his foot was holy ground. Every word he spoke was the word of God. Everything he touched, he brought to life. And the Lord Jesus Christ went to Samaria because there's one person out there that needs to hear what I've got to say. Now you say, well, what's going on? Preacher, I don't know. That's the sovereignty of God. Leave that to him. He chooses where he goes. He chooses who he speaks to. I'm thankful to God in 1973. He came to me and he spoke to me. And that's why I'm here today, folks. And ain't a man walking the face of this earth that's going to change that with me. No church has anything to do with it. I know personally whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that rest in your soul. If you've met him and you know him, stay with that. That's the anchor of your soul and your heart today. Amen. So he comes to the woman at the well, and that's quite a place. When you read the Bible, study the place, you'll find out that Mount Gerizim is nearby. You'll find out that Shechem is there. Shechem in Hebrew means shoulder. Gerizim in Hebrew means blessing. And Joseph is buried there. No greater soul in the Old Testament than Joseph. The Lord Jesus might have had a reason for picking that spot because it was quite a place. But Sychar now, Sychar, it mentions here, literally means a lion drunkard. So we've got something going on here that may be a little more than the eye can see. A lying drunkard, liar, and a drunkard in the place of the greatest blessing. Isn't that something? Think about that. How has God blessed us? How has he blessed this nation? How has he blessed my home? I, should be, I ought to be shouting and turning cartwheels, amen, for the way God's been good to me. Amen. He's been good to me, folks. God's been good to me. Has he been good to you? Has he been good to you? Amen. If you can breathe and walk and see and think and hear and smell, and you're up on top of the ground instead of buried in the ground, and even if you are in the ground, you won't be in the ground, but you'll be with the Lord. In other words, it'll all be good. Nothing's going to be bad for the soul that's saved. The path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more to the perfect day. It can only get better if you're born again. Amen. It can't get, wor it can't get worse. I see these unsaved people out here. They start wearing down. They're 75, 80, 90 years old. Lord have mercy. When you see the look on their face, they have no hope. They get, ha they get hard. They get, they get, they get cynical. Oh, man, everything that they had lived for has abandoned them. And now they're left with a stark reality that they're about to go off into eternity. Some of them were strong, beautiful, well-liked, talented. Yet that does them no good when they get down to the end of the way. So my body abandons me. It's falling off by pieces. That's okay. I'm getting used to it. So your body abandons you as you get older. Amen. But I know whom I have believed. Amen. It, I'm not depressed. <laughs> I'm not a bit depressed. I think about where I'll be and where I'm going. So won't you look at this thing for a minute. Look here carefully now at what happens in John chapter number 4. Because it's very important to understand that there's a great lesson to be learned here. First of all, he said, I must needs go through Samaria. He took his time to go off and go to one individual. Now, when we read that Bible, we understand more were saved. But he went to that one woman first. She'd been married five times, had five husbands. He went to her in the heat of the day at noon. And she came to Jacob's well. I've been to Jacob's well. It's quite a thing. If you ever go to the Holy Land, don't miss Jacob's well. That well is at least 4,000 years old almost. And you can walk in there and the water still runs. The water's still there. People are still drinking water out of Jacob's well. Jacob's well is about a hundred feet deep down to the surface of that water. And it says in John chapter before, this well is deep. What do you have to draw with? Notice how the historicity of the Bible agrees with what's going on today in reality. Amen? And so that well is there. The water is there. And it also shows the ingenuity and the engineering ability of the ancients. Because the bottom of that well is in solid rock. 
They went into the rock and they dug deeper until the water came forth. And that water now has been flowing for 4,000 years. And God Almighty knew that when that well was dug, he knew what it would be used for one day. What a lesson to be learned at that well. And so he said, I must needs go through Samaria. Thousands and thousands and thousands did not have a personal visit from him. To the Samaritan woman, the priests and all the rest of them and the religious people in Jerusalem and Israel, they wouldn't touch her. They wouldn't get around her because they'd be defiled. This is important. They'd be defiled from something from the outside. But the Lord Jesus Christ could walk up there and put his hand on her shoulder. He could walk up to a dead body and he put his hand on the beer. He could touch a leper. He could do any of that. Why? Because virtue was inside of him. Amen. And that is with you. If you're born again, the Holy Ghost is in you. In other words, you have a cleansing that's going on inside you. You can't be defiled. Are you listening? There is therefore now no condemnation to them that walk in Christ Jesus, who live in Christ Jesus. Satan would try to defile you. He can defile the flesh, but you're not the flesh. The flesh can be defiled. Flesh is flesh, dust of dust. But that's not you. And one of the greatest days of your life is when you'll find out your body is not you. That's a great day. You're not your body. Amen. Amen. So the virtue came forth from him. Christ cannot be defiled. He went to a Samaritan woman. And right after he had gone to this Samaritan woman, the Bible says that, that, uh, that others heard the message and they heard her testimony and they got saved. The Samaritans received him, the Bible says. And then he left there and he went to the Galileans and the Galileans received him. But the Lord Jesus said, a prophet hath no honor in his own country, among his countrymen. In other words, the Nazarites, or the Nazarene, rather, not Nazarite, but the Nazarene from Nazareth. They didn't accept him. They tried to kill him. They rejected him. But the people here in Samaria received him. It's like Naaman the leper. One leper in Syria because of one woman in Israel. And the prophet and the God of that one woman, he was able to be healed. Like the Syrophoenician woman had food given to her. She's a pagan. And my friend, like the dog, you know the dog that came to him and said, he said, it's not right to take the children's bread and give it to dogs. Yea, Lord, I'm a dog. I know that. You don't offend me. I'm a dog. I know I'm a dog, but I'm hungry. Amen. And the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the rich man's table. And so how are you this morning? How highly do you think of yourself? How can you receive? Some of you can't receive from God because you're just too big. You can't receive of him because you're just too strong. You can't receive of him because you know too much. As a little child, you ought to come to him and say, Lord, touch his feet and say, Lord, you know, I know a lot about you, but I, a lot I don't know about you. Amen. But the one thing that I do know about you, you're God. And everything that I've ever needed or ever will need is it resides in you. And call upon his name and sit at his feet and learn of him. And he said, I am meek and lowly of heart and you shall find rest for your souls. So the Samaritan believed. The Samaritan woman received him. He noticed what he said to her. He said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that talks to you. Some of you, you're at the point where you're maybe able to make a change. You're, you're, willing, you're willing to have an open mind. That's the first step. The first step out of darkness is an open mind. Well, maybe I don't know everything. That's a, that's a good thing. Maybe I haven't all figured out. That's good. That's good. That's good. That means you've grown past 17 and 18. <laughs> Amen. Because it didn't take me but 18 years to know it all. I knew it everything. How many in here were like that? I had, it, I had it all figured out at 18. <laughs> now I realize how ignorant and stupid I was at 18. But you got an open mind. You see, the culture in America and religion will close your mind. It will. I mean, you're just going to say, well, these Christians are a bunch of nuts. They're fanatics. They're crazy. They're stupid. You know, I don't have a thing to do with them. But if your mind begins to open, that means you're able to begin to receive. And he said, go call your husband. Hold on. 
She said, I don't have a husband. Now he's getting personal with her. He's getting to the point now where he can speak to her. You see, she's a Samaritan. I'm proud of being a Samaritan. Our fathers worship on this mountain. You know, and you say in Jerusalem we should worship. The Lord wasn't interested in that. He said, go call your husband. Well, I don't have one. He said, thou have rightly said. You've had five. And the man you're with now is not your husband. And the Bible doesn't say what happened to all the five. Five died or five divorces. Whatever. We don't know. It's, it's, it's irrelevant because if the you wanted, Bible wanted you to know it, said it. So it's not that big a deal, but she'd had five. In other words, she'd had a wasted, 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 wasted life. She was at her wit's end. She was ready to quit. She was at noon. She was drawing water from the well. She realized that she had, she had destroyed everything in her life that could have been good. She was a prime candidate to talk to somebody that could help her. Amen. Have you ever been there? If you have, if you ever been to the point to where you reach out to God for help, you'll find it. You will. I'm not talking about reaching out to the church. Now, I'm not talking about reaching out to men. I'm not talking about, sure not talking about reaching out to religion. And no, you don't need a self-help book. What you need is God. You need God. You need the Son. Did he love this woman? Of course he loved her. He loves all of us. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. He loved every one of us with an everlasting love. He said to her, if you knew the gift of God. Then he gets into the issue of water. Do you know the gift of God? You see, this is where you get a wall. You get, you get a wall that comes between you and that person you're talking to. How can I say this to you today? If you've never been born again, you just think we're different. But we all believe in God. We all believe in heaven. We all believe in Jesus. We all believe in the Ten Commandments. We all believe in living right. We all believe in doing the right thing, treat each other right, golden rule. We all believe all that. But you can believe all that and go to hell. You can believe it all and go to hell. Because what you're doing is believing all the stuff that everybody else believes. It's just, it's just kind of a, just a big basket full of cultural religion in America. I want to get you to the point to where you, for the first time in your life, you want the sun. The sun. You want the sun. He said, if you knew the gift of God, well, what was the gift of God? My goodness gracious, if you knew the gift of God, you'd ask of me and I'd give you living water. What is living water? Did you know that since the Samaritan didn't have the prophets in the Old Testament, they didn't know anything about living water? But if you read Isaiah 12 verse 3, it talks about wells of salvation. Isaiah 44 verse 3 talks about pouring water on him that is thirsty. Jeremiah 2 13 says, you have forsaken the fountain of living waters and hewn out cisterns that can't hold water. In Zechariah chapter number 13, verse 1, he says, I'll open up a fountain in your midst, a fountain of salvation. In Zechariah 14, 8, he said, it'll bring forth living waters. Water is a picture of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is the life of God. God the Father commissions the Son. Almighty, eternal God commissions his son. His son comes down and begins to act and do what the Godhead wants done. But everything he does, he does it by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. There's the Trinity. A spirit is life. If you've ever had the Holy Ghost move into you, you came alive. Have you ever had a time in your life when the Bible that was so dead and so foreign and you couldn't understand a bit of it, that all of a sudden you had a desire in you to read the Bible? Amen. You ever had a thing happen in your life where, you know, you never did pray. You might have prayed over your meal or something like that, but you didn't have any use for praying. But then something came into your life and you found yourself in your prayer closet and you found yourself pouring your heart out to God and talking to the Lord. You ever had a thing happen in your life where, 
the old man and all you thought about was the next sin you're going to commit the, you know the pleasures of life and that's all you live for that's what you live for sin pleasure sin pleasure but then all of a sudden something happens to you and you know a new way a different way sin and pleasure still there but there's a battle now beginning to take place inside you there's some there's a war going on yeah. inside you has that ever happened to you Amen. and have you ever come to a place in your life where the Lord Jesus Christ just kind of excites you to hear his name. Amen. Just excites you. Just moves you. You just love him. And you get offended when somebody runs him down. You ever had that happen to you? If you've had that happen to you, it's a good sign the Holy Ghost has moved in. And the Holy Ghost won't move in, my dear friend, until he's welcomed in. And this is all he asks you to do today if you knew the gift of God. Do you know the gift of God? I can tell you what he did for me. But you see, when it says no, that means experience the gift of God. Not know that it exists, but experience the existence of it. Have you done that? Oh, that you would today. That's what this is about. There's so much more about it here. Good night, man. But this is the main message of John 4. John 4. I'll give you living water living water life he'll he'll put you he'll make you alive have you ever had that happen father bless your word bless it this morning ali i believe there's somebody in this house right now that that word has spoken to they may be afraid they may they may be timid they may they may be nervous but lord i pray you take all that away and show them how much how much you want to give them eternal life. I pray this now in the Lord Jesus' name. For his sake I ask it. Nobody's looking. Heads are bowed. Anybody in here raise your hand this morning and say, Preacher Lawson, God spoke to me through what you preached. He spoke to me. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else, would you raise your hand and say, Yes, the Lord, God bless you. Hands back there in the back. Hands all over the place. God spoke to me. Anybody else, Preacher? God spoke to me. God bless you. God bless every one of you. I'm here to help you. I love you. I'm your friend. I cannot be, I'm not a go-between between between you and God. No siree. But I am here to help pray for you and help point you and direct you in the right direction. Anybody else, raise your hand. Say, pray for me, preacher. God bless you back here. Back over here. More hands. More hands. God bless you right there. Back over here. Hands up. Praise God. Hallelujah this morning. Hallelujah to God. Father, in Jesus' name, the Holy Ghost has come in here this morning. He's brought life with him. He, wherever he goes, he's life. Anywhere the Holy Spirit is, he's life. And, Father, I pray that that life would settle down in the souls of people, those that do not know you today, that they'd move upon this, they'd act on this, they'd know that this is their great opportunity they can see themselves with that woman right there at that well. They, they can identify with that. And they know that they, they know that he knows, that the Lord knows everything about them that he could possibly know, but he still offers them life. May that be happen. May that happen. May it happen. For those that already know you, God bless their soul. But they want to get closer to you. Father, let this be the day. Let this be the morning when they draw nigh to God. And James said that if you'll draw nigh to him, He'll draw nigh to you. That's his promise, and he won't fail you. God cannot lie. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand up and sing, brother.